Good afternoon and welcome to the special meeting of the City of Glendale Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, roll call please. Vice Chair Brazilian. Present. Commissioner Lambelot. Present. Chair Magrin. Present. Commissioner Perrion. Present. Commissioner Simurgeon is out today. Ex officio Akbarjan. Present. Ex officio Gulanyan. Sam, here. Thank you, Ms. Arapetian. Next item, please. Item 1A, report regarding the posting of the agenda. The agenda for the November 12, 2019 special meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside of City Hall on or before November 8, 2019. Item 2, introductions and presentations. Item 2A, introduction of new commissioner, Diane Lambelot. Well, I would like to welcome uh, Ms. Uh, Diane Lambelot to the commission once again, um, and um, would like to hear a couple of words uh, from you. Thank you, Chair Magrin. I'm very happy to be back on the commission. It was an unexpected surprise, and I'm happy to serve uh, as long as I can. Thank you. Thank you, and once again, welcome. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, please. Item 2B, introduction of new student ex officio members, Maria Ahverdian and Sam Gulinyan. Well, it's that time of the year again. Uh, welcome, both of you. Welcome, Sam um, and uh, Maria. And I would like to uh, you know, have an opportunity for each one of you to introduce yourselves, uh, please. Uh, hi, I'm Maria Akferdian from Hoover High School. Currently, I'm a junior attending the school. And um, I'm the junior class president. I'm the captain of the varsity cheer team. Um, founded the speech and debate team at the school, just a little to get a glimpse of what I'm involved in. And I think um, this position on the commission would allow for me to further get um, active with, with the community and really um, support my beliefs. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Sam. It is a pleasure and honor to be here and to serve as a student commissioner and also be male here. And I'm very happy that you gave me that opportunity to serve as a commissioner. Um, I've been in Glendale Committee since December 2016, went to Hoover High School, and then uh, now I'm a student at Glendale Community College and will be transferring to university next year. Uh, I've been a student worker since I became a student at Glendale College. and. Uh, the main role of me doing my job at college was to find out the problems of the students and try to help my team uh, to solve the problems for the students. Uh, and here, uh, since I have been through that, so I'm happy to bring those uh, women problem here as well and to serve the community and solve those problems too. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, please. Item 2C, presentation by Gina Mardian. She's the program director of Pacific Clinics. Okay. Hello. Good evening, commissioner and staff and students. Um, nice to meet you. My name is Gina Mardian. As she said, I'm the program director over at Pacific Clinics HIRAP. Um, we've been in uh, the community for about 20 years. We are located right now on Central in Glendale. We're a mental health organization. Um, we're under the umbrella. Um, we're called HIRAP. HIRAP, for those of you who don't know, means high means Armenian, so it's RAP services. It started fairly small, and we named it RAP because it was more about wrapping services around the family and kind of seeing them through. A lot of recent immigrants had come to the country, and there was no services in um, bilingual Armenian. So it was um, needed for the community. So about 20 years ago, it was started, and it was really just servicing the Armenian community. Now we service everyone. Um, we still specialize in Armenian services, but um, we do service everyone. Everyone um, in our program, there's about 26 of us, 27 now. Uh, everyone's either bilingual Armenian or Spanish-speaking. Um, we have about, I'd say, 60% of Armenian clients and about 40% of other, which is mainly Latino and, and other nationalities, but it's, it's kind of um, very indicative of the community. Um, we have several programs. Um, we, have, we do home-based, school-based, um, and um, 
I'm missing the third one that we do, and office space, yes, and office space services. So um, for the school base, we're in all the Glendale schools, so we go, we see our clients. Um, we do, I should tell you the, our population. So we service ages anywhere from five to 25. We also have a small adult program. It's um, fairly small. It, it was created to really help some of the children that we serve and their families who need their own individual. So we kind of started the adult program um, to service them. Um, so we have about, we service anywhere from 250 to 275 clients per year. And we work in all the um, schools, we'll see the clients. Um, at school, at home, at different locations. We have um, different types of services that we provide. We have case management services that will do a lot of behavioral mod with the, with the clients. They might sit in the classroom to observe on the playground to kind of work on socialization skills and redirect. Um, we have um, also two psychiatrists, one for our adult clients and one for the children. Uh, we have a variety of issues that we see from trauma to school behavior um, to ADHD, depression, really the gamut. Then we have some more, you know, we have some suicidal clients that we work with, some bipolar. So um, really a, a range of, of different diagnosis and different um, things that we treat. We also have a small TAY program. It's called FSP. Um, FSP stands for Full Partner, um, Full Service Partnership, and it is um, more intense. So for those, those are ages anywhere from 16 to 25, but really they're more like 18 to 25. Those are, um, we have some schizophrenic client, a lot of homelessness. So those are the clients that we try to get housing. They have a lot of needs. Um, so those are also some of the um, clients that we serve. We do family work. We try to work collaboratively with the community, with the school, teachers, um, and just sometimes it could be a pastor that we're working with. So we really try to um, work with the entire unit, not just working with the kids because it's more of a system issue um, that we work with. Let's see. Um, As far as um, we do, so we are a Medi-Cal based program. We basically service the low income uh, families. We do have um, indigent also, so if they have no insurance whatsoever, we, we have funding for that. Um, but it's really targeted to the low income population. And that's <laughs> it very quickly summed up <laughs> our program. But if you have any questions, I'm sure I forgot a few things. Um, thank you, Gina. Um, we appreciate you being here. Um, I personally work with Gina in Pacific Clinics very, very closely. We do refer a lot of our students that are Medi-Cal based um, and they do uh, need um, mental health services. Uh, the, uh, we do have an amazing relationship with the agency. Um, also, Gina serves, and she forgot to mention that, on our SAR board uh, with the school district's attendance. So students who have attendance barriers, we do have a board that we meet every other week uh, at the police department, and Gina has been an asset on that um, board as well. Um, and um, and they, she's an outside of the box thinker, so we appreciate <laughs> you, and we have a lot of need in the community as far as our students, families that, that are challenged by um, you know additional support, and uh, Gina and her organization, they've always been there um, for us, so we appreciate you, uh, thank you. Um, one thing I, I think that I wanted to also mention, although, um, Pacific Clinics, D.D. Hirsch, they're very much medical based organization. Mm -hmm. There has been at times that, you know, there are specific funds that we have housed and helped and assisted families with either diagnosis or, you know, with the homeless families that you encounter. So, mm -hmm. um, and one amazing thing is that they go to the schools and provide the counseling services. Right. Uh, so if parents are challenged with transportation, um, you know, their organization sends um, therapists in our schools. Right. So, and we go to the homes and also. And to the homes. Yeah. And, yeah. So it's really, you know, one of our programs, which is the more intense program, the motto is whatever it takes. So we do 
do things outside the box, do different things. We have small funding to help them um, with certain things like, you know, they really should it would be beneficial for them to work out or, or do certain arts or projects and we may be able to fund them and help them with that and, and just doing different things, different lo meeting them at different locations, doing different types of therapy and stuff with them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Um, hi, thank hi. you for coming, Gina. Um, so you mentioned ADHD, bipolar, and those diagnoses. How do you diagnose those, those children? So we are, um, everyone is either a marriage and family therapist intern, they're either licensed or intern, or they are um, uh, licensed social workers or social work interns working under a license of uh, their supervisor. So under that, we are able to diagnose. So we have to do an assessment, which is kind of a lengthy process. And um, so at that point, that's um, the clinicians and their supervisors. We give them the diagnosis based on a long history and getting all the information. For the more um, you know, severe that you were not sure exactly what's happening. We would get the um, doctor involved and have the psychiatrist also do an evaluation, and then he would also give a diagnosis. Okay, and then um, is it a nine to five program or is it a 24 seven no, program? It's, you know, it's very flexible with the hours. We don't work on the weekends, but we definitely do like late home visits. The families are working during the day, they will go into the home later in the evening. So, um, yeah, so it, it is pretty flexible. They're, they're doing at least two evenings, I'd say, a week, mm -hmm. most of the uh, clinicians. Yeah. And how do you deal with a situation where the children aren't cooperative? Uh, maybe the parents want to get them involved and they're not cooperative in getting the assessment done or the diagnosis done. Uh, okay. How do you um, deal with that? That is rare. We, we usually, um, we try to engage them initially. And honestly, they, we don't have too much resistance with, with the kids. Sometimes the parents don't want services. That's probably oh. more common than, yeah. than the actual children. But sometimes, you know, they're working with them for a while, and they kind of disappear on us. And some of the teens, they're, they're harder to engage. Um, they might come in initially and then kind of disappear. And we try to do the best we can if we absolutely can't see them then we have to close and is there um, the is case. there an age range um, up to up to 18 is it so we start from about five uh, we have seen kids younger than that and preschool but for the the average is really school age from the most of our clients are from eight uh, five to 18 and we do like I said we have some adults and some some um, up to 21 but the bulk of our clients are usually school aged and, and the, the payments to you are just through the Medi-Cal uh, program? Okay, correct. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, I have some. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for <laughs> providing this information. I'm curious as to, um, aside from partnering with the school district, mm -hmm. um, how can the general public be aware or become right. aware of your services? Um, if um, I heard you say that um, your clientele, most of them are ages 5 through 25, if they're not in school or if they're adults, um, how do they become aware of referrals? Your so the bulk of our referrals do come from um, the school district. However, we do get a lot of self-referrals, a lot of community, because we, we've been active in the community over the years. We get referrals from Department of Children's Services. Uh, we get uh, referrals from the Department of Mental Health, so they give referrals. Um, so they come from, we actually do, I'd say besides the school, the second biggest resource is usually word of mouth. And their kids receive service here or that type of um, phone calls, we get a lot of those. Um, but they're, they're various different, we're on different websites and so, you know, people sometimes just are looking at mental health services and will find us. So. Um, we, do, we do get calls from all over. Okay. Um, my uh, second question is, um, given your clientele and your dealings with the clientele and the issues, how do you uh, gauge your success? How do you measure your success? You know, if you, you've been successful right. with a client right. and, you know. Um, so they're working on gathering that information because we do, um, at discharge, have a discharge summary stating 
if they've met their goals and and so we do have that information currently they're working on kind of gathering that so we have better data just from personal I've been there about 13 14 going on 14 years now so um, and I I'm not familiar with every single case but a lot of it is run by me like we're closing cases so over the years we you know I've kind of made mental note do i have anything formal no but um we are very successful i feel because a lot of the discharges that we see are usually successful discharges not all of them but the majority and hopefully we'll we'll have that tool in place soon so we could actually know the numbers because i don't know the numbers but they are and we do get people come back a lot we get a lot of repeat um, clients that come back they were they did good they were successful but other issues have come up and then they call us and they want to come back for services. We get a lot of those phone calls. Well. All right, thank you so much. You ask a question, Chair Magrin. Hi, thank you for Hi. coming, Gina. Um, I had a question. You uh, mentioned um, that most of your funding comes from Medi-Cal, I assume yes. reimbursement. Yes. Do you also apply for grants or do service organizations give you grants or how does that a work? A few times in the past 13, we've gotten years, I can think of maybe one or two grants, but the bulk of it is um, built through Medi-Cal insurance. And the indigent is, I think, state funding and different types of funding for the indigent. Um, but not, not too much for the um, grant specific clinics does some fundraising also, but um, yeah, not too many grants. We've, I think, received two since I've been working here. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions? Questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Okay. We appreciate you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Item three, oral comment. Discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. The commission may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or discussion. Staff may refer the matter to the proper department for investigation and report. And currently we have one speaker. Uh, we have uh, Jean Kagan uh, from uh, Star Optimist International of Glendale. Welcome. Madam Chairwoman, members of the Commission on Women, thank you for having me here tonight. I'm here as a representative of Seroptimus International of Glendale. I'm the VP of Programs. And I'm here because getting a college education shouldn't mean having to go hungry. But data demonstrate that nearly half of California's 2.1 million community college students experience what is called food insecurity or probably the better word for it would be hunger. And 40% of community college students in California report skipping meals because they can't afford to buy food. Now that's a large number and you kind of have to wrap your head around it. But try this number. Every day on Glendale Community College campuses, the Verdugo and the Garfield, 1,700 and 50 students have to get food. Of that amount, approximately 75% are women. So that's 1,300 female students who need help with food. And as I said, when you take that down to a community level, that's really a more manageable figure, but it's still a very scary figure, okay? Now, there is a food pantry at Glendale Community College called Food for Thought, which the outreach coordinator is Professor Ellen Oppenberg. And she is the outreach coordinator and looks to find support for the pantry. And they do get support, but there's never enough support because um, I was at a recent seminar with Dr. David Viar and Representative Adam Schiff, and Dr. Viar um, gave the stats for the units of food they give out over a year. It's anywhere between 50 and 75,000 units of food. And again, think about it. Unless you're a student on the campus, you may not really realize 
that this problem exists right here in Glendale. Now, this doesn't take in to the number of students LACC, which is where the seminar was where I went, which has even a larger population of students. Citrus College, community college. And again, it's flown very much under the radar. Now, when students are worried about where their next meal will come from, or even if it will come, their ability to learn and attend class is, suffers. And often these students have to drop out of school. Talented students who should continue with their education. And when talented students are forced to delay their studies or drop out because of food insecurity, which remember is a nice euphemism for hunger, it's a loss for our entire community. And that's not my thinking, that is the thinking of Representative Adam Schiff, who actually has a bill that is going to be coming before Congress called, coincidentally, Food for Thought, which just happens to be the name of our food pantry here in Glendale. So we at Seroptimus have learned of this situation and have put together a forum, Hunger, the Hidden Crisis on our college campuses. Why? Because we want to raise community awareness with regard to this situation. The forum will be this Thursday, November 14th, at the library from 7 to 8.15. We have a distinguished group of people speaking. We're kicking off with Senator Portantino. Then um, Ellen Oppenberg, the professor, and who, who runs the Food for Thought uh, food pantry at Glendale Community College will speak. And then there's kind of a, a sister that often goes along with food insecurity, and that is homelessness. So Albert Hernandez, the executive director of Promises of the Verdugo, will give a short presentation. And then, as conclusion, we have about three students who will share their own experiences on the impact of food insecurity, on what it does to their college experience. So I would encourage anyone to please come participate and learn more about this very real situation in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair Madburn, I'd like to make a comment. I wanted to say thank you, Jeannie, for coming. <laughs> Um, as a member of Seroptimus, I'm very proud that we're doing this program. We've also um, been contributing to the food pantry through other programs. Um, and um, I want to thank Jeannie in particular. This has really been her baby, and she's worked very, very hard on it. And um, we're hoping that it really does open a lot of eyes to the issue. Thank you. Um, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, wanted to know, how do you find out that these students are going hungry is it their grades is it is it how they look is it they complain about it they that's, voice it that's that's the insidious thing about this okay if someone's homeless some you can kind of see it mm -hmm. if a student has just enough to get borderline nutrition like one of those teeny tiny mcdonald's hamburgers okay, right that's a, that's a form of food insecurity okay so you may not realize they're hungry. You know, they didn't get a good breakfast. They're not going to get a good dinner. And what is even more insidious is that, as I said, 75% of these students, at least at Glendale Community College, and this bears out from the data that I've seen for the rest of California, are women. And a lot of these women are women who are reinventing themselves. They've either come out of a toxic relationship or a bad marriage. They have kids. So, it's a roll down effect. If they have food insecurity, guess who else has food insecurity? And we know that some of the women who are drawing food from the food pantries are also sharing them with the kids. So um, all we can go is by the numbers and by the self-report <coughs> on, and we're probably not getting the full number. Right. Not everybody wants to admit, I don't have enough to eat. And as I said, it's women, minorities. Um, the next big group would be veterans who are attending. But as I said, I was really, really overwhelmed by the number of women that this affected. 
And what, what kind of food items do you accept and how do we take it there? Let's say I want to take some tomorrow. Okay. How do I do that? Um, anybody who comes to our <laughs> forum will get a nice list and all the information on how you can either provide food or, of course, cash is always good, uh, donations to the food pantry. In general, what they want are things that can be prepared very quickly, like um, a cup of noodles. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen those little packets of macaroni and cheese that are like pop top? You can just nuke them for a second and you've got food. Okay. It's that kind of thing. Or if you want to do legumes or rice, you want one pound packages. You want, don't want five pound packages. Because what they do is they get a number of points every month to quote unquote spend. And they have the points and they can go into the pantry and say, I'll take that, I'll take that. And one, one of the Trader Joe's also provides some produce and things like that. So again, it's how you spend your points. Okay, so they get points every month. Mm -hmm. that they, so it's like going to the market with a little bit of cash. Exactly, if you will. exactly. That's the way they've determined okay. to do it. Okay. And as I said, um, we would hope that folks would come next Thursday. But if you, if you don't, I can give Diane some of the flyers where we will have put together how do you donate, how do you help. And the thing is, is that it's not a big ask. Right. I'm, we're not asking you, write a check for $500. Do you know that with a $4 you can get a big flat, a cup of noodles? Yeah. And with that flat you can make a difference whether someone is hungry tonight? I mean, it's, it's really something that the people in the community can help with. And that's one of the reasons that we have taken up this cause, because it's something everybody can do something about. And is there an outside location where you collect the food, or do you walk it into the Garfield campus or the... Uh... That will be on the flyer. Oh. We recently did a food drive where we filled three 50-gallon bins of food, and then they were kind enough to send a truck for it. But they don't have collection points, at least not at this point. Mm -hmm. It would have to all go to the campus. But again, I've asked them to make up a flyer where people can find out how do I help. Right, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Yes. Uh, so this 40% of the students that do not get a meal, mm -hmm. is it because the student pantry runs out of food or, oh, no, it's or not, they're not eligible? No, it's not just this pantry. It's not just this pantry, but it's in general, if you look at the data from all the community colleges, okay, 40% of the students polled, and it was a very large number, say they can't buy food because they don't have the money. Okay, they don't, because they, they've either spent it on books, housing, other th gas to get there, um, lodging, that's, of course, if they're not living in their car because they're not one of those students who not only are they hungry, they're homeless. So, so but when it comes to this 1,750 students or the 75% Monthly. of them, so are, are these students cannot get the uh, uh, food for, for, from the food pantry because, of, because they're not eligible or no, the food those pantry? No, 1,700 students are going to the food pantry because they are hungry. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> um, yes. I, I was going to ask, um, I, I'm not sure how um, this complements, perhaps you can uh, explain how this program complements as and is aligned with the food stamp program. Are these individuals on food stamps? Um, that, that, never came, that never came up. The issue is the um, student hunger on campus. And apparently it is a large issue nationally because we've got Schiff's bill going national and we've got a California bill by Senator Dodd from Napa. It's a situation that has been recognized that is specific to college campuses. And it doesn't, it doesn't involve food stamps. No, but my question is, um, are these individuals, mm -hmm. if it sounds like they're, you know, uh, difficult situations and low-income 
obviously. Um, are they on food stamps as well? There is no indication in any of the literature that I reviewed that said they were getting food stamp stipends. Okay. So we don't know if they are right. getting Right. It wasn't food specified. They may be getting food stamps. Don't know. It, but it doesn't specify. As I said, I read multiple um, items. And then, um, as I said, I went to a special forum that Adam Schiff had at uh, LACC. And there was the whole discussion of food insecurity on campuses. And at no time did a discussion of food stamps or other government assistance enter into the picture. What entered into the picture was a discussion of the legislation that would be necessary to underwrite more food assistance for students on campus, most notably community colleges. Community colleges and secondarily trade schools have students that have this difficulty, more so than any other. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question um, for you. I'm sorry about that. Is there any way we could reach out to like the families of middle, high school, elementary school students and um, host the food drive that kids are willing to donate in exchange for um, community service given to them? I would be very happy to see what the folks at uh, Glendale Community College have to say. I mean, we've done, we did a food drive, the Seroptimist did, and I've heard um, that the realtors in Glendale do kind of a companion thing. There's food and then these students also need something as, as um, personal care items. A lot of them again. But the big thing is food, but secondarily is personal care items also. But I would be very happy if you wanted to contact me and see if there was any way we could help you move forward with that. I think giving out the list of what you guys are um, specifically looking for and handing it out to the schools, I think that's an, an amazing idea and a step forward to who, raising no awareness. No problem. As I said, the people at Glendale Community College are putting together the specific flyer because I said, after we finish the program, I said, people are going to ask, what can I do? I said, rather than trying to explain, I said, why don't we create a flyer? And that'll tell people how they can donate and what is needed. And then folks can just move forward. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And how will you be circulating that list, uh, list once, you, once you do out, put it together? The list will be given out at the forum. Okay. But we will have extra ones. But besides so, the forum, sorry, yeah. Amy. Besides the forum, um, would it be um, Po posted somewhere on social media or next door or Should be on Seroptimus website at some point yeah okay. and I mean um, we can talk about other ways to get the information out as I said we just came up with the idea of the flyer yeah. because we were saying oh people come then yeah. they're gonna say what can I do we need something tangible I also think that emailing towards schools throughout the community and also businesses what is also another step forward into raising awareness. So, good. an idea there. Thank you, Gina. I appreciate you. Thank so, you. Um, I just wanted to add on, um, this is an amazing uh, project, and we appreciate you being here. Uh, just to respond to one of your questions, um, anything that's donation item that we are um, um, advertising it in our school systems within the school I work for the school district and we do have a pantry for our for, uh, homeless and our foster students so it has to go through the PTA it's not something that we put the flyers out on schools and say do this so what um, would be helpful is maybe the flyer if we can get a copy um, and send it to Christine and Christine can distribute it to um, all of our commissioners and we can send it out to all of our you know um, acquaintances and people that we know in the community but we do have a huge uh, need in the district as well um, with our students that we serve. Uh, we have a lot of foster and homeless, and we do have a little pantry, very similar to yours, what you're serving at GCC. And uh, we you know, do understand it. it is very important. Um, you know, shelter is important, but you know, making sure that our students are being fed is very important as well. So thank you. Item 4, consent items. 4A, approval of the minutes of the regular commission meeting held on August 12, 2019. 
Roll call, please. Motion. Oh. oh, sorry. I apologize. Um, can we have a motion to um, approve? A motion to approve. A second. Um, okay. Vice Chair Brusillian. Yes. Commissioner Lambalot. We're, we're just uh, we're just clarifying. I'm sorry, yeah. but did you um, were you here at the last meeting? Yeah. Did you watch yeah. the meeting on? Yes. Okay, so you're able to um, uh, vote on the accuracy of the. Yes, minutes? I did watch okay. the meeting. So then that's fine. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No worries. Uh, Commissioner Lambalot. Yes. Commissioner Perrion. Yes. Um, abstaining. Commissioner Samarjan. Chair Magrin. Yes. Thank you. Item 5, business agenda. Item 5A, under action items, we have item 1, update regarding ad hoc committees to support the 2019 to 2022 strategic plan for the Commission on the Status of Women. Item 1A, motion providing further direction on ad hoc committees. Ms. Powers, uh, Ms. Powers could you please provide us with the overview of the procedures for selecting uh, the officers? Um, I will give you an update on this report, uh, Chair Magrin, members of the Commission. So earlier this year, the CSW created ad hoc committees to support its 2019-22 strategic plan. And at the last meeting in August, the Commission members volunteered to serve on um, the ad hoc committees, which can be found in the report that you have before you. And since the departure of Commissioner Burns and the addition of Commissioner Lambalot, staff had assigned Commissioner Lambalot to replace Commissioner Burns on the ad hoc committees that she served on, just so we could um, keep the momentum going for the Commission. And so at this time, should the Commission wish to make any changes to the makeup of the committees or provide the student ex officios the opportunity to serve on any of the ad hocs, um, a motion reflecting these changes can be made at this time. Um, and again, it's always recommended that no more than two commissioners uh, serve on any ad hoc. Um, ex officio, since they're not voting members, they, they don't meet the threshold for the Brown Act requirement. So as long as there's no more than two commissioners, we're okay to have these meetings on the fly. Um, and ex officios um, don't, don't add on to that threshold. Um, and at this time, too, if commissioners want to provide updates on the progress of their respective committees, um, you're also welcome to do so. So right now at this time on ad hoc committee one, um, the evaluate and assess ad hoc is commissioners Broussalian and Lambalot. Um, ad hoc committee two, which is communication and education, is commissioner Magrin. Um, ad hoc committee three, uh, community partnerships and outreach, is commissioners Perrion and Samarjan. And so if the students um, have had a chance to review those, they can go ahead and jump in and we can give updates now. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Powers, if I'm interested in one of the other ad hoc committees, either instead of or in addition to the one I'm on, how would we go about doing that? Well, that depends, Commissioner Lambalot. If it's one that, for example, if it's ad hoc committee two, then there's an opening there, mm -hmm. then that would work. If it's one that we have um, two current members on already, it would be a matter of whether that other member wants to switch. We can discuss that now. Okay. Um, I'd be interested in community partnerships and outreach, but Commissioner Submersion is not here, so I assume that we can't do anything at this point about that. Well, unless the, I'm sorry, um, unless that committee becomes a Brown Acted Committee and all the uh, meetings are sure. Brown um, uh, agendized in accordance with the Brown Act. That would require notification ahead of time, posting of the agenda, and I don't, having yeah, a Yeah, I don't think meeting. that it's worth staff resources to do that, so thank you. Did the students want to add, no pressure, but did, if the students um, are interested in any of the ad hocs? Um, the ad hoc that got me interested in the most is the second one, education and, let me clarify. Communication and education. Communication and education. I think that's what best applies to me and what I'm in right now. Okay. Thank you. The same thing for me. I would be interested for communication and education.
Do we need a motion? Yeah, at this time, let's just, uh, just so it's reflected in the minutes that um, we have ex officios Akhverjian and Gulinian um, will be joining ad hoc committee two um, along with Chair Magrin. Okay. Can we have a motion to move this item? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Vice Chair Brusalian? Yes. Commissioner Lambelot? Yes. Commissioner Perrion? Yes. Chair Magrin? Yes. Next item on the agenda, please. Item 5B, reports, information only. Item B1, update on the Commission on the Status of Women's Legislative Agenda. Ms. Paris, could you please provide a report on this item, please? Sure, thank you. Uh, Chair Magrin, members of the Commission, um, so this report uh, provides you with an update on the status of the state legislation that the Commission had previously recommended to City Council regarding women and girls. And during this session, which started um, at the beginning of the year, the state legislature introduced over 2,600 bills, and um, 1,042 of those made it to Governor Newsom's desk this year. The governor had until October 13 to sign or veto any of those bills that came to his desk. And he signed 870 bills. He vetoed 172. Um, that made his veto rate 16.5%. And interestingly, that is the identical to the veto rate of former Governor Jerry Brown's rate in 2018, which was his highest rejection rate in his 16 years of office. Um, and at this time, um, you can see in the report of the bills that the commission had recommended to council, four of those made it to the governor's desk, and of those four, the governor's actions matched the commission's position 75% of the time. So three of them he um, supported and signed into law, and one of them he vetoed. So the ones that he signed into law pertain to health care coverage for maternal mental health, lactation rooms and public transit stations, and law enforcement for senior and disability victimization. The one he vetoed has to do with housing for elderly and individuals with disabilities. Um, it seemed that the governor, any time that there was any um, bill that had to do with ongoing funding, he was not inclined to sign those and create ongoing expenditures for fear of the recession. Anything that was one-time funding, he was more inclined to do. It seems like um, he's more interested in putting those kind of long-term things into the budget and working those through the budget process versus um, the legislative process through bills. Um, and then the legislature will reconvene for the second of its two-year session in January 2020. So some of these bills that we have on our agenda that are um, stuck in committees, those have the ability to come back. Um, some of them may, some of them may not, but those may have um, a second chance in this coming year, which will start in January. That concludes my report if you have any questions. Does it, anybody have any comments? All right. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, please. Item B2, update on Domestic Violence Awareness Month activities. Sure. Ms. Charles, could you please provide us in a report on this item, please? Sure. Uh, Chair Magrin, members of the commissions, this is an update on the commission's two activities for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, month which was... Um, observed in October of this year. So the first was the proclamation um, recognizing Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Glendale, and that took place on September 24th. And um, Chair Magrin was there, and members of the commission were there. Um, I believe Commissioner yeah. Bruce Allian and, and uh, Commissioner Lambalat. Oh, and you brought it, thank you. Yes. Um, to proclaim uh, October 2019 mm -hmm. as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Glendale. And then the other one was the Candlelight Vigil and Purple Tie Awards. And this was, again, a commission partnership with the YWCA of Glendale, as has been every year, to do the candlelight vigil, um, which took place on Wednesday, October 2nd. And this year, there was um, a new and interesting element, which was the Purple Tie Awards, which was to recognize men in the community who um, support uh, YWCA in helping um, combat domestic violence in the community. And so there were three awards given. One went to um, our very own Sergeant Alex Krikorian of the Glendale Police Department as our law enforcement advocate of the year. Um, James Maddox was the YWCA's volunteer advocate of the year. And their community partner advocate award went to Albert Hernandez, executive director of Family Promise of the Verdugos. Uh, the event was very well attended, I believe better than many years that the candlelight vigil has taken place in the past and included a number of community representatives and the program is included um, as exhibit one of the report and I know Chair Magrin thank you for giving remarks on behalf of the Commission thank you any questions <clears throat> 
Thank you. Next item on the agenda, please. Item B3, program update for the 19th <coughs> Amendment Centennial Celebration. Ms. Paris, could you please provide us a report on this item, please? Sure. Uh, Chair Magrin, members of the Commission, as we've discussed before, uh, the year 2020 <coughs> marks the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment of the United States Constitution, which granted women the right to vote. And so the Commission has partnered with the City of Glendale's Library, Arts, and Culture Department um, to celebrate the centennial in Glendale. And the Library Department has confirmed that there will be an exhibit in the Downtown Central Library's reflect space for the centennial. Um, and the exhibit will run from January 31st to March 15th. Uh, reflect space exhibits are usually accompanied by a lecture or a panel discussion or a film screening. Um, and as such, the library department has assigned staff to help with this um, endeavor, including the reflect space curator. There is a draft title and description for the event. Um, it is a draft, so it might uh, get changed. But for now, um, it's looking at exploring voter disenfranchisement for women of color and exploring the multiple histories and forces that have positioned women into places of power culturally, politically, and economically. Um, the exhibit will open on January 31st um, in the evening and will feature either a speaker talk or a panel discussion as part of the opening reception. And then the League of Women Voters is also coordinating a high school video project where students um, have the opportunity to submit, uh, create and submit three minute, uh, up to three minute video shorts, either film or animated, um, surrounding the theme of the 19th Amendment. Um, you know, what does a woman's right to vote in the United States mean? Um, or what has suppression of a woman's right to vote in the United States meant? Um, and it could be personal, it could be about their families too. Um, the video contest winners will be recognized at an event at the library on Saturday, March 7th. And I believe the um, League of Women Voters will also invite a representative from the commission um, to help judge the videos. So watch all the videos and serve on the judge, judges panel as well. And that'll just be based on availability and interest in sending a member of the commission. Any questions? That concludes my report. Comments? Thank you. Will we get more updates as we have more detailed information about that date? Yes, Chair Magrin, absolutely. Um, recognizing that there won't be another meeting until then, but certainly as um, program information becomes available, um, staff will send that out to everyone from the commission so that you're aware. Um, but definitely pencil in January 31st for now, but we will definitely send out more information. Um, there'll be a nice layout, uh, postcards will probably be created, digital postcards that we can also, the commission can um, share with you know, your networks too and invite them to come to the exhibit. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, please. Item six, commission staff comments. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to revisit uh, ad hoc committees uh, number three um, regarding the um, um, Commissioner Lambelot's um, suggestion to join that ad hoc. Um, considering uh, Commissioner Samarjan, um in the event that she is not able to fulfill attending the ad hoc meetings as she has not been able to attend the last two. Uh, is it possible that we can have a backup commissioner assigned so that when she is not able to fulfill, um, we can have uh, another commissioner step in? Just to be sure, are you asking to revisit the item tonight or to place it on a future agenda for discussion? Whatever is appropriate. I know the question was raised, um, you know, if we want to uh, reassign. Uh, in the absence, I, I respect the, the absence of Commissioner Samarjan, so, um, you know, she's not here. However, I do, you know, as, a, as the second member on the ad hoc committee, um, I, I do like to have support with another commissioner to move this forward because you know it just makes us stronger so let's just read the item back into the re record because i if i'm understanding you correctly you'd like to have further discussion on this topic i would so let's just you. open um let's just read that item back into the record i think it's agenda item a1 um, update regarding ad hoc committees to support the 2019 to 2022 strategic plan for the Commission on the Status of Women. 
item 1A, motion providing further direction on ad hoc committees. Now. No. <laughs> okay. Um, um, so I would like to propose um, having a backup commissioner assigned to ad hoc committee number three for community partnership and outreach. In the event uh, Commissioner Samarjan is not able to attend, um, case in point, the last two ad hoc committee me meetings that uh, we have had with staff, uh, Commissioner Samarjan has not been able to attend. Um, so I would welcome the support of a second commissioner. So the question is, can you have a, a, a third commissioner assigned to that? And, and I understand that, that you're saying that um, there's the potential for an absence of a, a committee member attending the meeting. Um, the issue isn't just the attendance at the meeting, but the subsequent discussions. And so when you have multiple commissioners having a discussion on a particular topic, now you've got a, a quorum discussing it, and that would require that, there, that the meeting be agendized. So for purposes of that, um, and like I said, we've got a couple of options, I think, here tonight. One is to revisit the actual structure and perhaps reassign individuals um, we obviously don't have the benefit of Commissioner Samarjan to see if she'd like to have the continued participation on that committee or um, not. Um, alternatively, to have a third commissioner uh, join the commission, and we will continue to um, agendize those meetings. Um, uh, certainly there's an additional step for staff, but it can be done. Um, the third step would be to postpone the item to a future meeting where we would have the benefit of um, Commissioner Samarjan's um, input um, as to whether or not she'd like to continue to participate. If she hasn't been available um, due to scheduling conflicts or just general absence, um, the commission may want to you know, look into that a little bit further. Uh, you recommend, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, um, I was just going to say that, you know, that ad hoc committee aligns with my other interests and other community activities, but I really, um, I don't think, I wouldn't want to put staff to any extra work to add a third commission member. So I would suggest that we postpone it till the next meeting. Okay, so my understanding then is we cannot have a backup. So should the appointed Commissioner not able to make it, then Commissioner uh, Lambelot can step in. That's not an option. It it wouldn't be an option because you would have um, subsequent email discussions. You would have to. It's not just the physical could, presence yeah, at I a meeting, okay. because if you meet and you have a discussion and then there's some follow up work that you'd need to do, then obviously you could do that by email. If you only had two commissioners, you would not be able to do that with a third commissioner. Any other comments? Okay, we'll read um, item six back into the record so we can come back to commission and staff comments. Okay, item six, commissioner staff comments. No more? Comments? No? No? No comments. Thank you. Next item. Item seven, ad adjournment. So thank you all for um, your comments and also welcome. Um, I hope that you do uh, enjoy your time with us um, um, and we're very excited to have you, uh, Hoover High School and a uh, representative from Glenair Community College. Um, I'm now requesting a motion for the adjournment and it is um, 5.55 p.m. I motion to adjourn. I second. Meeting adjourned at 5.56 um, p.m. Thank you.